to ask me what topic, what force has the greatest influence on us? What resonates the most with our souls? I'd answer without hesitation. It is the freedom to choose. Besides being born, the power of decision-making is the greatest gift. Just think about it. You are not the product of your genes or of your education. You are the result of your decisions. Dwight D. Eisenhower said, the history of free man is never written by chance, but by choice, their choice. So yes, life is about making decisions and success is the result of a decision, but have you ever, and please raise your hands if yes, have you ever made a decision that you got happy from, that made you happy? Who made a decision in his life that made him happy? Look around, guys. I see someone not raising their hands. Either you're asleep or I feel bad for you. All right. Has anyone ever made a decision whereby you earned lots of money? Who made a decision that got you a lot of money? Good for you. <laughs> Tell me your secret. All right. Anyone made a decision that cost you a lot of money, where you lost lots of money? Oh, that's more people. <laughs> All right. We'll talk about that just in a bit. So when it comes to relationships, have you ever made a decision to go into a past, okay, a former relationship that you'd like to forget? Who's being honest? All right, all right. And now just between you and me, anyone in a current relationship you'd like to forget sometimes? <laughs> all right, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. You see, it's not that easy to make decisions. Um, actually, there's plenty of them, about 20 thousand decisions every day, most of them with lightning speed and unconsciously. And the big decisions in life, we adjourn them. Where are the deadline junkies? Yeah, right. You're not alone, guys. The phenomenon is called procrastination. So most likely, if you adjourned one of the big decisions, even small ones, one out of three decision traps might be the reason from preventing you to take action. In this talk, I'm going to talk about how you can prevent those decision traps. But let's start with our brain. Think about it, your brain. I mean, it's a toolbox, right? Only issue is most people don't really know how to use it. Evolution, right, prepared us for four million years. And what do most people do with it? They watch Judge Barbara Salesh or Dr. <laughs> Phil all the time, all day long. I know it's sad, but it's the truth, right? So, what you gotta do is you must take responsibility for your own brain. And make no mistake, guys, making no decision is still a decision. It means you're allowing somebody else to make the decision for you. In the past 10 years, I've been honored by working with top decision makers, and I learned from them some stuff, and I'd like to share it with you today. So, what actually is it that top decision makers do differently? Well, first off, they know what they are, who they are, what they want, and how to get it. They set their own standard, right? So, actually, they make decisions based on their own values, and they are self-determined. Second, they have their self-management in order, especially when it comes to their emotions. And I'm not talking about people who are robots. I'm talking about emotional state management. Third, they really do make decisions, right? But even more important is they need and they do implement those decisions in their daily life, in their businesses. And I'm not talking about exaggeration, like this pretty fellow here. Now, actually, I'm talking about advocating your convictions, standing by what you feel is right. So, not so long ago, in Nazi Germany, when Adolf Hitler, the Führer, came up to a public event, you were legally bound to salute for him and do the Hitler Gruß. On this picture, there's a man, Gustav Wegert, and he did not. You see, the prerequisite for self-determination is the freedom to choose. He did not have that freedom. Actually, he was imprisoned afterwards. 
Unfortunately, today we are confronted with a vast majority of options, way too many. It kind of is exactly the opposite, right? In our consumer society, maybe if you went to IKEA, chances are when you are at the cashier's desk, you got at least one product more in your basket than you originally planned to buy, right? I mean, it happens to everyone. This phenomenon is called an irrational buying decision. And actually, this is caused by the stimulus overflow, by way too many options. It just paralyzes the brain in the decision-making process. I'd like to call it the monster choice dilemma. And just stay with me on this one. Think about Generation Y. There are lots and lots of young adults today that do not really know what to study, what to do with their lives, right? And I think it's not a surprise, actually, because they know they could literally do anything they want, but they still don't know what they want. Why? Because they have all the options. They're paralyzed by the monster choice dilemma. And that is actually our first decision trap. The first decision trap out of three is the stimulus overflow. Being confronted with way too many possibilities and options just paralyzes your brain. Neurophysiology, neurophysiologically in the decision making process. I'm not a native speaker, surprise. Second decision trap is the permanent stress we live in. Where does permanent stress come from? Today, it's the high performance pressure. In business, in daily life, even in the family, even in education, kids are starting to get burnout because of permanent pressure. And the third decision trap is perfectionism. And a great author, Stephen Covey, he wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He said about perfectionism, perfection prevents action. So what do top decision makers actually do differently? First of all, they don't seek perfectionism. What they do is, if they feel confident that they have 80%, round about 80% of the information necessary to make a decision, they just go for it. They don't wait hours, days, weeks, months for the last 20% to come around. If they got the 80% that's necessary, makes them feel confident, they make the decision and take action. So that's what you gotta do. Next trap would be that under stress, humans tend to fall back to old habits. That's not a big problem at first, but if you think about it, if we tend to fall back on old habits, even if in, we're in a new situation, we might use a habit that's not working anymore today. And then we're right. So how do those habits develop? Before we dive into how you can change them, they do develop by conditioning. Meaning, if you're confronted with a situation the first time, you're urged for a decision. What actions you gotta take? and then you respond accordingly. And if the same situation happens over and over again, this decision turns into a habit. You don't really have to think about it anymore. It just happens. It's automatic. And that's good, right? That's okay, as long as it works. But if you're confronted with changing conditions and a new environment, the old habits might not work anymore and you have to make a new decision. And that would work unless you were stressed. Because under stress, we fall back on those old habits that have proven themselves over time, even if they don't work anymore. Before we do that and dive into that, what happens to the brain under stress, I'd like to invite you all to test your own habits. And just follow me on this one. Put your hands together like this. Just fingers crossed all the way. And have a look at your thumb. Which thumb is on top, left or right? You can even check with the partner sitting next to you. Which thumb is on top, left, right? All right, and now I want you to switch the thumbs. Put the other one on top and just for a moment, see how it feels. 
How does it feel? It feels kind of awkward, right? It feels pretty strange. Why? Why does this small thing feel so strange? It's because the way you did it first, it's your habit. And you're used to that. We call that the comfort zone. Yeah, Virginia Zatir started with that in the first place. It wasn't called the comfort zone at first. Place. So now you changed it. You changed the habit. It feels uncomfortable because you left your comfort zone. We're going to need that later on. So according to behavioral economy, it takes some, quite some time to change existing habit or build up new ones. For example, around about two months, 66 days does it take, in the morning after you get out of bed and you want to establish a new habit, for example, drinking a glass of water, right? After you get out of bed, right away, drink a glass of water, supposed to be healthy? Pretty easy, doesn't take that much time. Getting out of bed, or maybe rolling out of bed, I don't know about you guys, and you have to do 50 sit-ups? Not so easy, takes longer. That's pretty similar when it comes to decision-making. Easy decisions, we're not really that stressed about. Works. The big, difficult decisions. Somebody's supposed maybe to play in Jaws next time I do this. Dun, dun. The big decisions. We feel a lot more stressed. The funny thing is, intellectually, it's just two decisions. There's no difference. You just have to make a decision in either ways. But emotions have a huge impact on the whole decision-making process. So that's what we've got to look at. The brain under stress. So what happens to the brain under stress? In the center, the green part is the thalamus. It's not really green in real life. The green part, the thalamus, is kind of like a watchdog. And what it does is, if you're relaxed and happy and everything's fine, you're in your comfort zone, and new information comes in, the thalamus is supposed to process that information to the frontal cortex, right here. And that's where you can make smart, calm, rational, good decisions. But under stress, what happens is a lot of cortisol comes up. It's a stress hormone, and it kind of blocks the thalamus. He's unable to cope with all that information coming in. So he kind of freaks out. And then there's help. Amygdala steps in. She's like a little diva. Don't photograph me on that one. Like a little diva. And amygdala, what does she do? Actually, she's trying to help. Amygdala steps in, she's trying to help you, and she does that by trying to prevent you from danger, dangerous situations. Just think about it for a second, yeah? You might be 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 years back in the days, you were walking through a forest, very nice weather, and there would be a sable-toothed tiger jumping out of the forest, and you'd be like, oh, sable-toothed tiger. That's you in a calm, easygoing state, no stress involved. And the thalamus, the watchdog, goes, oh, I see, a able to tiger. Forward that information to the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex goes, oh, wow, a able to tiger, never seen that one before. Hmm, how would it maybe feel to pet it on the furry head? Not such a good idea. So that's where the stress hormone kicks in. The amygdala goes, wait! I saw that guy two days ago, he tried to pet it. He got no hands, no head, he did. So, that's good, right? That's good. Stress kicks in, amygdala goes, no, run, and you're alive. So, amygdala tries to prevent you from danger, and she does it by overriding your system, and that's a great escape reflex, actually. Problem is, today, if we get stressed, it's not so much because we see a sable-toothed tiger, and we don't really have the necessity to just run away. So, how can we cope? with that. Because the same escape reflex happens if you're just under stress because your boss puts up a big folder right in front of you on your desk, it goes wham! And you're like, what? And he goes, we have 30 minutes left and you gotta fix this problem now. And you look in the folder, the first page, and you know instantly you've never done a task like this ever before. And you get pumped up, you get stressed, and you might get blocked. So that's a big issue. How do top decision makers cope with that? Actually what they do is, they train their brain under stress, and they do that by leaving their comfort zone. They train to leave the comfort zone where they feel comfortable and easy by starting out new th stuff, new things, constantly changing their habits and looking for new ways to explore, and let's face it, uh, get a little bit crazy about it too, but they always want to perform better and improve their own habits. 
So how do they do it, actually? And Navy SEALs do it as well. Navy SEALs, they have to make good decisions even if somebody's shooting at them. That's what you should do, actually, train your brain. But good news is you don't have to be shot at, all right? You can do it like this. Just try out new stuff, new things. Yeah, even small but constant changes in your habits keeps the brain alert. And the cortisol level rises even in everyday situations just because they're new out of your comfort zone. And your brain gets used to that higher cortisol level. So just try out new hobbies, try new things. And your brain learns to make great decisions regardless of a high cortisol level. That's how to do that. All right, now to sum that up for you guys, the first trap we had was the stimulus overflow. Too many possibilities, too many choices. If you don't know what to study, if you don't know what project to start, narrow it down to the top seven. Maximum of seven chunks of information that the thalamus, the watchdog, can cope with. Everything above seven is not good, so to make great decisions, narrow it down, prioritize, summarize to the top seven chunks of information. Second, the permanent stress. We just talked about that. No sable tooth tigers involved, except maybe metal concerts, I don't know. But the permanent stress, how to cope with that? Your own emotional state management. Train your brain under stress by constantly leaving the comfort zone. And the third trap was the perfectionism. Top decision makers, if they feel confident, they have about 80% of information necessary to make the decision, they just do it. And if there are problems or errors on the way, they fix them on the way, but they start implementing and they take action. To end my talk, I have a message from my heart for you. It goes like this. You did not decide to be born but actually you can decide if your life is of significance. So make your decision. I wish you great success.